Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to the live Facebook The show that discusses theological arguments from the book Haqqiyyakeen by Sayyid al-Shabbar Last episode we were discussing one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do with his power or powerful omnipotent Qadir, Qudra And we're looking at how the creation also reflects and depicts the power and uh, the omnipotence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Insha'Allah we're going to continue our discussion with a new topic where we look at the creator of the universe Now we have two arguments in the world today in regards to the creator of the universe We have that the creator and the sustainer and, and, and the one that maintains the universe is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a God And the other is Mother Nature Mother Nature was the one that created the universe Mother Nature is the one that sustains and maintains the universe Inshallah we'll discuss more with my co-host Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Banjo. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Hayakum Allah. How are you this evening? Alhamdulillah. Wa shukran. Always a pleasure to be with you. Barakallah. So, Sheikh, we have, you know, these two, you could say, ideas or these two arguments. One is saying that God is the creator of the universe and the one that maintains and sustains the universe. The other is Mother Nature. Um, you know, what is Mother Nature? And, and is Mother Nature being? Is it an actual mother? Or is mm. Mother Nature, are they trying to say that the world kind of takes care of itself, self-sufficient? Care to elaborate? Sure. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. When it comes to understanding the force uh, that is responsible for the creation of everything within existence, and then the maintenance, if you could say, of everything within existence, you'll find that it is very helpful and it is actually imperative for a person to understand the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hence you will find that within the manhaj of the mutakallimin, within the manhaj of the ulama uh, who have uh, put forward this manhaj of ilmul kalam, seeking uh, or walking in the line of the Ahlul Bayt, alayh salam, you will see that even the chapters and the topics, subtopics within the classical texts of Usuluddin are very logically placed such that questions like the one you have just posed to me are answered systematically. Um, from the many theories that exist out there uh, or the many beliefs that exist out there in regards to the force that is responsible for the creation or that maintains this creation, when it comes to answering the argument or tackling this argument between a God which all Abrahamic faiths believe in or Mother Nature, it is important that this answer to this question, we will try and address it by looking at two of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal being mukhtar and we will come to the meaning of the word mukhtar and the second one is murid. Murid meaning or derived or one of the derivatives of the word being irada. One of the verbal constructions arada, yuridu, innama for example innama yuridu Allahu li yudhiba ankum urrijsa ahl al bayt وَيُطَاهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا اللَّهُمَّ صَلِّ عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى مُحَمَّدْ By having an understanding of these two sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even at a very basic or at a very shallow level, it will be able to help us understand mm -hmm. and to answer the question whether it is Allah or it is Mother mm -hmm. Nature. So we will attempt to answer this question over the period of this show but by referring back to the text and understanding the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then seeing whether these sifat are applicable on this force called mother nature and then perhaps if we have time try to understand even though I'm not an expert in mother nature or the definition of mother nature or the belief of mother nature but hasab the information that is available we will try and see whether these characteristics are applicable negate it or what it is maybe we find out there is another creator called mother nature <laughs> you will see from the answers that come forth and where our discussion takes us Inshallah. if we begin 
uh, with the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that Allah azza wa jal is mukhtar. Mukhtar yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ikhtiyar. Ikhtiyar yani very loosely translated he has free will in his actions. Free will in the sense that he has choice to do or not to do. Mm -hmm. He has absolute control over his actions. And you find over here that Alama Shabbar, Rahmatullah Alay, he comes forward in introducing this concept of ikhtiyar, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mukhtar, uh, by saying over here, innahu ta'ala mukhtarun fi af'alih, in sha'a fa'al wa in sha'a lam yaf'al, wa laysa bi mujab mudhtar fi sudur al-af'al, anhu kanar fi al-ihraq wa shams fi al-ishraq. Rabbi Shabbar goes on to say, from the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he is mukhtar, he has free will. As we said, he has a choice to either perform an action or not, not perform, perform an action. action yeah. Which consequentially means God is not forced, obliged or subjected to an action or to performing an action. Mm -hmm. And the example that is drawn out over here by the Sayyid is uh, the example of fire and the property that fire has to burn. So fire, for example, take fire for the sake of understanding this argument, take fire to be a force. This force has certain properties. One of these properties is the property of heat. You cannot have fire without heat. And the second property of this force, i.e. fire, is that it burns. Yes. Anything that comes into contact, anything that comes into contact with this force, fire will burn. You put a piece of paper, at, on the flame, paper will burn. You put your hand around the flame, you will feel the heat or you'll feel the warmth. So the fire as a force has certain attributes, has certain properties. And through these attributes and these properties, actions then actualize themselves from the property of heat. It gives us warmth. And the property of that same heat and action is emanated in that the fire burns the paper. Having said this, the force, yani fire as a force, when it is exercising its attribute of burning anything that comes into contact with it, does this fire as a force have choice in exercising mm -hmm. that attribute or no, the fire doesn't have any choice. The character and the attribute, it is inseparable in the sense that fire does not have choice, that it will decide to burn one thing and decide not to burn something else, or to keep something warm and not to keep something else warm. So over here, like the way we understand that fire being a force, that also has attributes that emanate into action, but it does not have a choice. Because it doesn't have a choice, yani this sifat or this attribute of mukhtar cannot be in it. This attribute cannot be separated. It does not have the ability to separate itself from the consequential uh, result of this attribute. Yes. And the same thing when it comes to uh, the sun, for example. The sun being a force, a force that provides heat, for example. The sun as a force, does it have the ability 
to take away from itself the property of heat? La. Because it does not have this ability, yani it, is, it cannot be a force that is self-governing in itself. It has to have a force higher than that, that has actually created it with an inseparable property. Fa. When we look into the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah azza wa jal is mukhtar, he has absolute control over his actions, to do or not to do. And you find that within the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned, or this sifat of Allah azza wa jal, can be understood from a number of verses within the Quran. And we always share, I think, week in, week out, we share. It is very important that we understand or we are able to prove our usuluddin and our aqidah from within the Quran, not for the purpose of converting others or engaging in uh, discussions. And this is important, perhaps secondary, but most importantly for us, Shia ithna ashari, Muslims, I need to have ikna, I need to have absolute yaqeen, conviction in the concepts that I claim to believe in. The word aqidah from the word uqd, yani like a knot, yeah. you've seen when you tie a knot, mm -hmm. it is so, f the knot is so firmly tied that if a person wants to try and undo it, he can't. Mm -hmm. Linguistically, this is the meaning or this is the word through which the word Akida is derived from. Yes. Akida, yani a belief that is so firm in your heart, belief that you believe in so firmly, nobody can convince you otherwise. And you cannot abandon your faith for anything whatsoever. <coughs> you see, and this is Bain al Kaushain. This is one of the problems that we see in today's day and age, particularly when it comes to the concept of imama. And with all due respect to all our viewers, respected brothers and sisters, in regards to a number of Husseiniyat, Imam Bargas, sometimes we tend to lean towards secular beliefs, non shii beliefs, because that firm conviction is not there. There are other forces, other factors, other beliefs, other agendas mm -hmm. that Definitely. we feel are much more important than imama, such that we are willing to let go of imama, we are willing to let go of wilaya. We're willing to discount the importance of wilaya in order to pursue other things. Why? Because that uqda is not there. That deep, firm conviction is lacking. And hence, the starting point is always knowledge. So it is important for us, and even madrasa teachers, whichever level of the community in which we are, scholars, ourselves, we have to be firm in this belief. Fa, where did this concept or how are we able to prove the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is mukhtar? There are a number of verses in the Quran. The one that I have picked out and one that Alama Shabbar, rahmatullah alayhi, mm -hmm. rahmatullah alayhi, the one that he points to in the book over here is, you know, I thought, why did he pick this verse? He's picked the verse, verse from Surah Ali Imran, verse okay. number 40. Third, third Surah, verse 40. Verse number 40. And this is the verse of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Quran outlines for us the event between or the event surrounding Nabi Zakaria and him being blessed with a child. Verse number 40. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Kala Rabbi, anna yakunu li ghulamun wa kad balagani al-kibar wa imra'ati aqirun. Kala, kathalika, al kathalika Allah yaf'alu ma yasha. 
Zachariah says, Ya Rabbi, oh my Lord, how can I have a child? And I have reached such an old age. And my wife is barren. Yani defies all science. Indeed. Defies the rules of biology. Mm -hmm. Ya Rabbi, the man is elderly in age. Perhaps doesn't have... Uh, the, the, his wife is barren. The biological reasons that are needed or the biological criteria that are needed to conceive the natural factors, nature, natural, the natural factors that are needed to be in place in order for a child to be conceived are missing. Mm -hmm. And despite that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَلِكَ Allah." This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah يَفْعَلُ ma yashah. Allah does what He wills. Tayyip, now I thought over here, why did Alama Shabbar use this verse in the Quran? Because this verse, the last part of the verse, كَذَلِكَ Allah يَفْعَلُ ma yashah. Allah does whatever He wants. It points towards two sifat of Allah. And it actually combines these two together. The sifat of qudrah and the sifat of ikhtiyar. MashaAllah. So you find over here that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, كَذَلِكَ Allah يَفْعَلُ ma yasha, Allah does whatever He wants. The first indication from this part of the verse, or the first sifat we are able to understand, Allah does whatever He wants. Ya'ani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mukhtar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has free will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has choice. He could bless a couple with a child even if those biological, scientific reasons or factors that are needed to conceive are missing. Allah can do that. And if He wills, even for those people, where everything biologically ticks the box, according to nature, ticks the box, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can decide not to bless them with a child. So this is the first natija, or the first consequence, or uh, sorry, consequence, the first result that is derived from this aspect. The second conclusion, which reinforces what we discussed last week, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wahua ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over everything within the creation. He has the power to alter the law of science if he wants. And he has the power to enforce new laws of science if he wants. So from here we understand that the first sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that he is mukhtar and he has absolute control and choice over his actions. Tayyip, now if we understand this aspect of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we go back to our original question. The original question being that is Mother Nature responsible for creation? Is Mother Nature responsible for the upkeep of this creation? Or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So then we say that in answering this, our first step is that we ask the question, what is this force? Mm -hmm that we are referring to as Mother Nature. Who is Mother Nature? What is Mother Nature? How did Mother Nature come into existence or was it before even the realm of existence came into existence? Having said this, the force of Mother Nature, if on the premise we accept that Mother Nature is a force that has a role in the creation of this universe 
or in the maintenance of this creation or in the design of this creation, then the next question that we ask is, is Mother Nature mukhtar in its af'al or no? Mm -hmm. Does this force called Mother Nature, does it have this power of choice and will? Or is this Mother Nature and the power associated to this perceived force? This is on the premise that this force Mother Nature exists. Huh? So it is a conditional argument. This force Mother Nature, does it have choice or does it not have choice? Wouldn't you say then it should have a conscience if it has choice? Or some sort of, you know, um, consciousness being, if it has a choice. Does it have a consciousness? Yani, it could be one of the questions that we ask. Yani, mm -hmm. is this a force that has wisdom Ascent, yeah. behind it? Is it Hakim? Hakim again from the sifat of Allah subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala. Does Mother Nature as a force have this sifat of hikmah? And where can this sifat be uh, deduced from? So when it comes to this concept of mukhtar, does Mother Nature as a force have this mutlak will or not? If we say that the forces of Mother Nature, the force of Mother Nature and the power that it exercises in regards to the creation or the design of this universe, its power is subjective just like the way we said in the beginning between the sun or the property, the force of fire and its ability to burn and give heat. If this force does not have choice, then it cannot be a deity that is all-powerful to begin with. And it is through, through this sifat that we are able to invalidate by posing this question because there are many aspects or many aspects of creation that if they are attributed towards Mother Nature, then this sifat of mukhtar, there is a question mark on it. Because if the force does not have free will, mm -hmm. it does not qualify to be all-powerful. If it does not qualify to be all-powerful, then it does not qualify to be worshipped because it no longer is that superpower ah, deity ah, in later layman terms. Mashallah. So, let me let me get this right to to, to just like you know, conclude. If there is such a thing that has you know uh, ability to, let's say, look after the universe and take care of of right. the world, but it is doing it on without its own accord, as in it has no choice. It doesn't have a wisdom or knowledge behind to make a decisive decision to actually do this to maintain the universe. Right. And that. So even if it is looking maintaining the universe, because it is not making a conscious effort, it is not worthy of being worshipped. It is. It does not qualify as the creator or being responsible for the creator in the same way as the sun. Mm -hmm. People used to worship the sun because the sun was perceived as the force that gives light through which gives heat, which is an important factor for life Indeed, to yeah. survive, yes, for yes. plants to grow. Yes, yes. However, because the sun does not have this decisive power mm. of separating itself from its attributes and its consequential actions, we come to the conclusion that Baba, yes, it is a force, but not a force that is a creator, a force that is a creation that demonstrates the power of the creator. Inshallah. Which is why you see that in one of the mannerisms in which Nabiullah Ibrahim alayhi salam 
when he debated with the people of his time and they said to him, we worship the sun and they would worship the sun and in the evening when the sun sets, <laughs> he would say, okay, where is your God Lord now? now? <laughs> where is your Lord now? So understanding the argument in this way. See, it also boils down to understanding. I don't know how much time do we have before we go on break? No, no, no. We have minute, half minute? Indeed, yes, roughly. Um, when it comes to understanding these arguments, Islam is not against science. And we've said this a number of times. Forces that we find in nature, forces within this universal system of cause and effect, as a Muslim, we believe in them in the sense that we do not negate the existence of these forces. Rather, understanding the system of creation and understanding the system of cause and effect leads us to the conclusion that there is a deity who has put these, who has put this system of cause and effect into existence. We don't say that the, from within the system of cause and effect that because we found the cause, there is no other cause behind the cause. We don't stop at the cause and say that this is the creator or there is no other creator because we are mahdud within this system of cause yes. and effect. La, we have to, and this is where the intellect comes into play. And this is where... Deen comes into play. This is where the messages of the Anbiya come into play when it comes to Tawheed. It is about discovering and understanding the cause behind the cause. People during the time of Nabiullah Ibrahim salam, they worship the sun. The sun being the cause of life at a zahiri level. Nabiullah Ibrahim salam, came and said, La, this is a form of ignorance. Why? Because when you don't stop at that cause, look at that cause behind the cause. Look at who is there to have brought this sun into existence, who has put it into this nidam. When obviously we say when the sun rises and the sun sets, Nani, in our system, <coughs> excuse me, of the rotation of the earth and so on and so forth. Ahsan to man. More inshallah we will go into detail uh, after the break. If, you are going to do it. <laughs> Asad, Sheikh, thank you very much. Inshallah, uh, to all the viewers, please join us after the break. Inshallah, we'll continue the discussion here on the live Facebook. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the live Facebook. Shaykh, now before the break, we were discussing, uh, you were saying that Mother Nature has two sifat. Um, and we were discussing Mukhtar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being Mukhtar, meaning that he has you know, the, the freedom of will. He decides what he wants to do, when he wants to do. And you uh, showed us a Quranic ayah, uh, Surah Imran, Ali Imran. Verse 40, I believe it was. Yes. Um, what's the second sifat you want to discuss? The second sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the sifat that Allah azza wa jal is murid. Okay. Murid, yani that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from one of his sifat is irada. Irada, generally speaking, yani he has will or intent or say when it comes to a theological perspective the appropriate word would be decree he has the power to decree and he has the power to ordain uh, it is important to understand this sifat 
in that. Man also has the power of intent, which means that man also has the power of irada, and man is also murid. Does this mean that man is mushtarak? Man shares this character of irada with the Lord of the universe? Mm. If we say that man shares this attribute of Allah, at one level, the creation and the creator, man and Allah share a common denominator and, the sh and share a certain extent of power that is equal. Or man shares a form of intent that belongs to Allah. As per the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, this sort of understanding is an understanding of shirk. Even though we find that this baseline understanding and this very, very shallow summary is a concept which is propagated by a number of scholars within the Muslim world. Shia, unfortunately, and the non-Shia. And this comes to, it boils down to having tried to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through a medium other than Ahlul Bayt. And we will see how we tie this to this issue of Mother Nature. You find over here that the issue of Irada, even within the classical mutakallimin, they're divided I wouldn't say divided, but they have differing opinions in regards to the exact meaning and the precise implication of this sifat irada. And you find that even the way Alama Shabbar rahmatullah alayhi, uh, advances towards this topic is very different, for example, to the way that uh, Ayatollah, for example, Ali Husseini al-Sadr, rahmatullah alayhi, uh, a great uh, alim from the ulama in terms of uh, ilmul kalam. And perhaps if we have a chance, we could uh, speak about him at uh, some point. But the way he tackles this issue of irada uh, in his text, uh, Aqaid al-Hakka, which uh, in essence uh, is a brilliant is a brilliant book in uh, Ilmul Kalam to delve into and uh, from the many texts that are out there available at the Hausa level, uh, Aqaid al-Hakka by far, um, you know, as has been mentioned by uh, the ulama and the maraja in Najaf and in Qom, uh, when it comes to understanding Usuluddin from the Manhaj of Ahlul Bayt, the book Aqaid al-Hakka is by far one of the most uh, comprehensive and one of the most important books uh, that uh, a person can come across when it comes to this journey. Irada, so if we were to switch from the book Hakul Yakin to Aqaid al Hakka for this particular sifat, you will see over here that answering this question, it says Irada, we said, is intent. But over here, he goes on to clarify at the very beginning. Lakin iradatullah taftarik an iradatil makhlukin. The power of intent which is possessed by the creator is different from the power of intent possessed by the creation. How? Fa iradatullah huwa fi'luhu. فَإِرَادَةُ اللَّهُ هُوَ فِعْلُهُ يعني The intent of Allah Azza wa Jal in itself is the action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The intent of God mm -hmm. is the actions of God. 
Yeah. See, for the human being, it is different. And, w you know, this is why we say that some of these theories that come out f of Wahdat al-Wujud, for example, or the theory of multiplicity, the unity of existence through multiplicity, mm -hmm. in essence, is nothing but shirk at its purest level. Yani through this theory of unity through multiplicity, apart from it being a logical fallacy, it doesn't hold the, uh, if you were to scale this argument as per the rules of logic, you'll find that you can't, you can't even lay the premises of the argument in a manner that is correct. So apart from it being a logical fallacy, you see that it is actually the purest form of shirk. The, if there was any purity, it's a purity mm -hmm. in terms of its resemblance to shirk. In that the Anbiya, for example, they came and they condemned those who took idols as partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or attributed the sifat of Allah to the idols and there were 300 and 400 prophets came to condemn them Nabi came and condemned them and then subhanallah you have people who come with theories where they say there are 6 million of Allah <laughs> in any case this inshallah uh, is, is a discussion for mm -hmm. its own mm -hmm. but the important thing over here to remember is this and this is extremely important regardless of which stage of a journey you are when it comes to Usuluddin. Regardless of whether it is in the Madrasa, regardless of whether it is Hawza Ilmiya, what we have even been told by the ulama inside of the Hawza. And I remember this always used to be mentioned to us in uh, Sayyidah Zainab and in Najaf al-Ashraf. Regardless of which stage the scholar is at, there is one thing that person always has to keep in mind. And Sarahatan, it's something very simple, but it's something very, very detrimental the deeper oh. we go into our studies. And this is the verse of the Quran. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Laysa ka mithlihi shay. Laysa ka mithlihi shay. Didn't say laysa mithli. Ka mithli. Kaf, yani kaf of tashbih. They say in Arabic grammar. There is nothing like him. Baba, the khalik is absolutely separate from the makhluk. Mm. There can be no mushtarak sifat mm. between the khalik and the makhluk. Awesome. Two separate entities altogether. So, when he comes over here, uh, the author, Rahmatullah Alay, says, the irada of Allah, yani the intent of Allah, this attribute of intent, this attribute of, of having a decree, this intent or this attribute of giving a decree, of wanting to give a decree, for example, is different from that of a man. For you and I, when we say intent, meaning that the, where there is a process that the human being goes through, that there is an intent, and then based on that intent, the action emanates from the man. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is for the makhluk. However, the khalik, the concept of irada is totally different. Where the intent is the action mm -hmm. and the action is the, the intent. intent. Tayyib. Ah, what is the proof for this? Sayyid al-Sadr goes through this. And he quotes this hadith in Majma. وَنُكِلَ فِي مَجْمَعَ الْبَحْرَيْنِ الْحَدِيثِ مَجْمَعُ الْبَحْرَيْنِ حديث on authority of Imam Rida صلوات الله وسلامه عليه إِنَّ الْإِبْدَاءِ إِنَّ الْإِبْدَاءِ وَالْمَشِيئَةِ وَالْإِرَادَةِ مَعْنَاهَا وَاحِدٌ وَالْأَسْمَاءُ ثَلَاثَةٌ The concept of ibda' يعني to bring into existence from non-existence 
and this concept of will and intent, mm -hmm. yani decree, all of them, the meaning is one, but the mm. names that are given to it are yes. three. فَالْمُسْتَفَادْ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَدِلَّةِ أَنَّ إِرَادَةُ اللَّهِ مَعْنَاهَا إِحْدَاثُهُ لِلْأَشْيَاءِ وَإِبْدَاؤُهُ وَفِعْلُهُ لَهَا يعني the intent of Allah is the action of Allah. Allah. The action of Allah is the, the intent, intent of, of Allah. Allah. There is no time gap between the intent and the action in that Allah has to intend something and think about it and mm. ponder and then the thought translate into an action. La. فَإِذَا أَرَادَ شَيْئًا أَن يَكُولَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ The intent is inseparable from the action. And you find over here that this is a concept that is important. And then there is a concept of irada, which could be, or the, uh, which could be tied to the concept of the commands of Allah and the prohibitions of Allah. The wajibat, for example, and the muharramat. And this is the line that Sayyid Shabbar goes down through. However, we will omit that for now because we want to also address this issue of mother nature and yes. how this sifat will come to that. But having said that, let me just run by you one hadith. Inshallah. Over here in regards to the decree of Allah. Because yani, we said by irada, intent, the rather precise term would be decree. The decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is for the Muwahid. Hadith is Sharif on authority of Amir al Mu'minin, Salawatullahi wa Salamahu alayhi, Mawla al Muwahideen, master of all monotheists. And you know, this title is very interesting for Amir al Mu'minin. Mawla al Muwahideen, the master of monotheists. Yani, if you are a monotheist, <laughs> You have to have this belief in the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mini. Monotheism becomes complete through Amir al-Mu'mini alayhi salam. He says in this hadith, he is actually, Amir al-Mu'mini is narrating a hadith al-Qudsi. A conversation that happens between Allah Azza wa Jal and Nabiullah Dawood. Let me give you a fada'il by way of ishara. I will okay. stop at this. I will not spend too much time. I will go. Okay. But within this, there is an indication of people who have ma'arifah. Awesome. This is a conversation between Allah yeah, Azza wa Jal and Dawood. Nabiullah Dawood. Amir al Mu'mineen is the one narrating this conversation okay. between Allah and Nabiullah Dawood. Amir al Mu'mineen doesn't mention, or the question is this How did Amir al Mu'mineen know, know? How did Amir al Mu'mineen know of this conversation between Allah and Nabiullah Dawood? He doesn't say that I heard from the Prophet. That the Prophet told me that Allah spoke with Nabiullah Dawood. Mm. Amir al Mu'minin is narrating directly that there was a conversation that happened with Allah and Dawood. Where did Amir al Mu'minin know from? Within this answer, there's a fadila and a big fadila of Amir al Mu'minin. We'll not answer it, we'll let that be. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum, ya Amir al Mu'minin. He says, أَوْحَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَ إِلَى دَاوُودِ Allah revealed to Dawood and he said to him, يَا دَاوُود تُرِيد وَأُرِيد You want and I want. You have intent and I have intent. 
You have certain decrees and I have certain decrees. Remember how we said in the beginning mm -hmm. that the irada of the makhluk is different from the irada of the khaliq. وَلَا يَكُونْ إِلَّا مَا أُرِيدُ Allah is telling Nabi Dawood. Nothing will ever happen except through my decree, my will, my intent. Yani the decree and the intent of Allah prevails over the decree and the intent of all other human beings. Everything within creation is shadowed by the decree of Allah Azza wa Jal. And from this irada or this understanding of irada, we understand that Allah is Qadir. Yes. Qadir. He has power over everything. Mm -hmm. And from here we now, you start to see as you go deeper into the studies, that the sifat, how we said Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said that the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be separated from the that of yes. Allah azza wa yes. And that all these sifat mm -hmm. are interlinked because in reality their essence is one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tayyib. When we come back to this issue, if we understand this mm -hmm. concept of irada, decree, and this concept of Ikhtiyar, yani Allah Azza wa Jalla being mukhtar, will and intent, free will, which he exercises over everything and anything. Yes. And we come back to Mother Nature. We say, number one, what is this Mother Nature? Mm. Like the way we said in the first part of the segment, you'll find that some of the most famous or some of the most accepted definitions that come forward for Mother Nature is a personification of nature. Okay. That focuses on the life-giving and nurturing aspects of nature okay. by embodying it in the form of a mother. <laughs> okay. So, within the system of cause and effect, yes. we took this cause, the cause which is apparent, and gave it the name of the mother, because the mother generally, metaphorically, or within this outward system is mm. seen as the source of life, yes. or the channel through which life is given to another. Mm -hmm. So it's attributed to a governing force. Mm -hmm. However, our question is that, who is the force behind the force? Exactly. Man should not be so intellectually shallow to stop at that cause. And then look what he goes on to share. Images of women representing Mother Earth and Mother Nature are timeless. In prehistoric times, goddesses were worshipped for their association with fertility and mm -hmm. agricultural boundary, bounty. Yeah. And this was the commonly held belief within Assyrian, Babylonian, Roman, Greek, and Indian religions prior to the inception of Abrahamic religions. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on to say the earliest written usage of this concept of Mother Nature uh, dates back to 13th or 12th century BC. Wow. This means that, number of conclusions, how much time do we have? Don't worry about the time, Shaykh. Ya Allah. No, we have till 10, 10 minutes, so I know how to, or how <laughs> deep to formulate the arguments. Four minutes. Tayyip. So the first thing over here is this. The arguments that we have right now that are put forward to us in regards to Mother Nature being the force, these are not new arguments. This is not a break, a breaking discovery. And neither it is an intellectual argument that has just surfaced mm -hmm. as a result of a better understanding of science law. This concept of Mother Nature existed way before. Way before even the coming of Nabiullah yeah, Isa, 13th yeah. or 12th century before Christ. Mm -hmm. Now this is the important thing. This concept of Mother Nature being 
the force responsible for fertility and agricultural bounty and so on and so forth. Yani properties of the Khalik who is Qadir, who has Qudra and who has Irada as we saw because these are characteristics that are manifested within the creation. They were attributed to this force of nature which was then represented in a female image. image yes. And this was the leading theory in Greek and Indian philosophy and Assyrian philosophy, Babylonian philosophy, even before the coming of Nabi Isa. Mm -hmm. So number one is not a new argument. Number two, we come to see that these beliefs are the very beliefs that the Anbiya came to negate. Yani, if this was the ideological belief of deities, Mother Nature, a personification of nature in the form of a female force that governs certain aspects mm -hmm. of our existence. And this was the predominant belief before Abrahamic faiths. Yani, Nabi Nuh came to do what? To fight people who had this notion. Yes. Fight, yani not fight. Intellectually. <laughs> Nabiullah Ibrahim. Mm -hmm. He came to invalidate their argument. Yes. Nabi Isa alayhi salam came and invalidated these mm -hmm. arguments. Then how is it that these arguments that came into existence. So now you see you also come to understand. And this thing is very important. That even the Anbiya of the past. The likes of Nabi Ibrahim. The likes of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Nabi Musa. When, you know, we have this mental picture in our mind that these were, you know, backward people, yani by backward, the, yes, they were backward, but what I mean is, yani, savage. And yes, they were savage, but at their time, they claimed to be the intellectuals of their time. Indeed. They had philosophical arguments mm -hmm. in regards to their idea of the creation and the existence of the earth. And some of the highest, most influential, the aristocrats of the time, the most successful businessmen of the time, yielded to those beliefs, which the Ambiya came to nullify or mm -hmm. invalidate. And we find that this cycle is repeating itself mm -hmm. even in this day and age. Yes, and therefore, you see the type of the arguments these Anbiya have come to invalidate. And if we understand this and you look at everything within the realm of the big picture, you find that one of the, what is branded or marketed as one of the greatest achievements of Ma'amun, Al-Abbasi, was that he, you will find this a lot within the books of the Mukhalifin. Ma'amun, this is the brother of Harun, yes? The, the Persian. I mean, oh, okay. yes. Where the Imam Rada, this is During the, the, the Abbasi leader, yeah. during the time of Imam Rida, salawatullahi yes. okay. wa okay. Ma'amun was the one who was responsible for the translation of a lot of Greek, Roman, okay. Indian philosophy uh, into Arabic text. Okay. And the Mukhalifin, and there are a number of Shia who are also of this opinion, in that they actually praise Ma'mun. And they say that he was the Abbasi Khalifa responsible for the spread of literature. And I've heard this from, from Shia scholars as well, scholars. Where they say, yes, you, you didn't give Imam Rida his right. He suppressed Imam Rida. They don't believe in the Khilaf and the Wilayah of Imam Rida, but he done Islam a big service because he spread this culture of literature. But when you look at the Qadiyya, when you look at the issue a little bit more deeper, what you begin to see is when you scratch below the surface, you start to see that Ma'amun actually began a movement 
by exporting and funding the translation of deviant philosophical schools of thought, he laid the foundation to fracture the theological belief which unites and strengthens the Shia, the mm. Muslims, not only between themselves, but fractured their relationship and their understanding with their creator to begin with. And was he trying to promote mother nature in, in this? Yeah, I mean, uh, from a lot of these things, if you have a look over here, you look at some of the arguments, whether, the, whether he promoted mother nature or not, we have to look into the type of the arguments that uh, uh, these philosophers came with when, when they came into uh, the Islamic lands. But a good shahid on this is what? A good uh, uh, proof to drive home our point is where? You look at the arguments and the debates that Imam Rida Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi has in this book compiled by Sheikh Saduk known as Uyun Akhbaru Rida. Okay. Look at the theological arguments. Ma'amun brought these individuals to try and defeat Imam Rida, a ploy to fracture the correct theological belief that existed and that emanates from the school of Ahlul Bayt as the most accurate one. Subhanallah, Imam Rida came on top and a lot of these people uh, changed their belief system uh, and Imam Rida invalidated a lot of their beliefs. But what we are trying to say is that these arguments are not new groundbreaking discoveries yeah. in regards to how nature uh, came into existence and how the universe, the universe came into existence. These are arguments that predate back to even before the time of uh, Nabiullah Isa. So, to end, our question over here is this. On the assumption that Mother Nature is a force that is responsible for creation and a force above which there is no other force, our question here is, does Mother Nature have the sifat? of irada? Does it have the sifat of qudra? Does it have the sifat of ikhtiyar? If it has the sifat, where can these be proved from? If they don't have this sifat, that means there is a force above the force of nature. And in our intellectual journey of discovering what or who is responsible, for the root of creation, then we have to go further to discover above yes, yes. Mother Nature. Many times, in my opinion, and I remember one of the scholars, uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Ja'far al-Shirazi, uh, he would always say, many times, some of the attributes that are granted to Mother Nature actually are attributes of Allah mm -hmm. Azza wa If these people were to know yes. what you are referring to or the attributes that you are giving to Mother Nature is actually Allah. They need that further push mm -hmm. for them to be able to see just below, beyond what is mm -hmm. apparent mm -hmm. and they come into the fold of Tawheed. Ah, ah, Thank you very much Sheikhna for, for, the, for the dialogue and for, for the discussion MashaAllah and thank you for all the viewers for joining us inshallah we'll have a new discussion on the next episode of the live faith book inshallah see you then assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh